right, well, let me tell you what we're doing here, and then we'll um, get into it. This is the last sermon for a while in the Covenant Home. Um, after this, we're going to do three sermons on Christmas from Luke, and then we'll do a couple of more sermons about the coming year. And then Dr. Moss is going to preach a couple of times in January when I'm gone, so the rest of the Covenant Home series will not happen until the end of January. So this is the last one of the Covenant Home for uh, probably about, about two months almost total. But this is an important one. I want to describe what kind of sermon this is. There's different types of sermons. Some sermons are really do this, don't do that type sermons. You know, uh, Matthew, Sermon on the Mount's a good thing for that. You know, don't lust, don't get angry, things like that. Some sermons are about God's character, who God is. The resurrection, the crucifixion are all about who God is and his character. And then some sermons are more about worldview. And the sermon this morning is about worldview, or it's a mindset sermon. It is a mindset. And the question I want to answer this morning is how are we supposed to think about children and why don't we think that way as a culture? Okay, how are we supposed to think about children? What is our mindset toward children supposed to be? And then why do we as a culture not think about children that way? And if you think about our culture in general, there's a couple of huge things that happen in our culture that indicate our view towards children. One, obviously, is abortion. Um... It's hard not to look at abortion and say we're. It's hard not to look at to look at abortion and say we're a society that loves children. Anybody who would kill their children obviously does not love children. Okay, so as a society, we do not love children, and abortion is a good sign of that. A second sign is just the rejection of motherhood in general. Uh, women working, women being career minded, women being independent. That has created this mindset that is a complete rejection of motherhood. Motherhood used to be elevated to a position of, of supreme importance. In fact, some would argue that motherhood was the greatest job anyone could possibly have. The task of a mother was superior to the task of a father, was more important than the task of a father, because the mother had to do with the day-to-day -day operations of a child. If you go through the works of the Reformers, the works of the Puritans, guys like G.K. Chesterton, Charles Spurgeon, guys like that, they understood that the role of a mother was at the center of, of the Christian life. And to reject motherhood was to reject the greatest good that a woman could possibly do in this life. And of course it was to reject children as well. So those are two things, abortion and the rejection of motherhood, that indicate how our society thinks about children. Okay, let me give you a statistic here. I quoted this to a few of you before, okay? So in 1909, there were 127 births per thousand women. Okay, and these thousand women are between the ages of 14 and 44. Okay, 14 and 44. There were 127 births. Okay, 1960, you might think the birth rate dropped. Well, it hadn't very much. By 1960, it was 118 births per thousand women. Still, it hasn't dropped that much. 2012, it was 63 births per thousand women. Between 1960 and 2012, the birth rate had been cut in half. 118 in 1960. Per thousand women, 63 in 2012 per thousand women. Okay? So there is no doubt, looking at statistics, looking at what's going on, that children are hated. Motherhood is hated. And those two go together, obviously. Okay? Children and motherhood. Children are hated. Motherhood is despised. Even among the church, uh, the church is not much better on this front. She doesn't have more children generally than those out in the world do. Okay? So what I want to do this morning is divide this up into two, three, really three sections. First of all, what does the Bible say about children? Okay, and this should be, hopefully you're familiar with this, but I want to reemphasize it and go over it again. Then the second section will be, how did we get here? How do we get to a place where the church has rejected the blessing of children? Where society has rejected the blessing of children? Because part of a good diagnosis is understanding what caused the disease. Okay, what caused the disease? What got us here? Was, does that guy have emphysema because he was smoking? Does that guy have emphysema because he worked in the factory? What got him to this place? Well, we need to ask ourselves what got us here, and then I'm going to end with some practical application. But I want to begin with the Bible's teaching on children. Let me just say this across the board. There is nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible, where children are considered a curse to God's people. Okay? In fact, everywhere in the scriptures is exactly the opposite. All right? Let's begin with Genesis 1. We've gone over this before, but in Genesis 1, God commands Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. That's part of the dominion mandate. He made us to bear children, to bring them into the world. 
that is part of what he did. But as you go through the scriptures, you see this, this theme keeps coming up. And we could go, there's a lot of places we could go into here. You could think about the Hebrew midwives. Okay, think about the Hebrew midwives. They refused to kill their children. Why? Because they considered them important. It wasn't just a moral issue. They considered their children vital. And out of those children came the Savior of Israel, Moses. Okay? And you could go on and on down the line through lots of different narratives. Abraham considered it important to have children, a blessing to have children. But I'll look at a couple of specific passages here. Starting in Deuteronomy. And again, there's a lot of Old Testament data. Um, I think the big question a lot of us have is, has something changed in the New Testament? Because the Old Testament is very, very clear on this point. Okay, very clear. Um, um, Deuteronomy chapter 5. And this is a telling of Ten Commandments. I'll just read this to you. You should not make for yourself any carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is the water under the earth. You should not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Okay, and the picture here is that the faithful father produces faithful children, and this is a desirable and good thing. Okay, there's another passage in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 7. Let's see if I can find this. I'm, I'm remembering this one, but I don't know. I didn't write it down, so I don't know if I can find it off the top of my head. There's a passage in Deuteronomy 7. Anyway, Deuteronomy 28. No, I won't go into all these, but Deuteronomy 28 starts off with blessings and ends with cursings. And you'll notice that one of the curses here is that the fruit of your womb will be cursed and you will be, the fruit of your womb will be taken from you. Okay? So one of the curses on God's people is that they will lose their children. All right? And this is found in Deuteronomy 28, verse 18. Deuteronomy 28, um, verse, yeah, verse 18 is the main one I was thinking of. There's a couple of other ones throughout the passage as well. So in the curses, one of the curses that would come upon Israel if she disobeyed God is her children would be taken away from her. That is a sign of a cursed people is when their children are taken from them. All right. And therefore, obviously, it's a sign of blessing when they get to keep their children. Okay. And then let's just go into the Psalms. Chris read one. There's a lot of Psalms that emphasize this point. I'll read you a couple here. Psalm 78 talks about telling God's word to the children. We will not hide them. Psalm 78, verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Verse 6. That the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, they might arise and declare them to their children. So the writer's saying we're going to declare it to our children, and then our children will declare it to their children. And on and on down the line it goes that they may set their hope on God and not forget the works of God. Okay, So the picture here in, in Psalm 78 is the passing down of the faith to the children. Okay, Covenant faithfulness passing down to the children. Psalm 103 says something real similar. Psalm 103. But the mercy of the Lord is 17 and 18. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to grandchildren, not just children, but to grandchildren, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. And then Psalm 102 says the same thing. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. Okay? Psalm 102, verses 27 and 28. All right, so the picture here throughout the Old Testament is that children are a blessing. If you think about the saints, Hannah. For example, Hannah wanted children. She couldn't have had them. Eventually she had them. But she saw children as a blessing. Okay, Sarah saw children as a blessing. Jacob, Isaac, all of our fathers in the faith saw children as a blessing. They wanted them. That is what they desired. Okay, Children were a blessing. Let's see if I got any other Old Testament passages here. And besides 127 and 128. Okay, well and then the main ones are Psalm 127 and 128. And I'm going to preach on these psalms in the spring. Now, what's interesting about these psalms is there are a group of psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. And these were songs that the Israelites sang as they marched to Jerusalem. Okay? As they marched to Jerusalem. And you can see how this fits perfectly. You're going up to Jerusalem with your family, and you have all of these children. And this song is a reminder that children are a heritage from the Lord. Verse 20, Psalm 127, verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage, a gift 
from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. It is a blessing. Like arrows in the hand of the warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Okay? And again, the picture here is, it's great to have a lot of children. That's the idea. That's the picture in Psalm 127. 128 reminds us that the faithful man will have faithful children, and those children will be all around his house. His house will be fruitful. Okay? His wife will be a fruitful vine. Okay? And what it means there is children. She will bear children. She will have olive plants uh, all around the table. So the picture there is of a large family with lots of children. Okay? And Israel saw this as a blessing. This was one of the central parts of their job was to bear children. Okay? And we could go, there's a lot of other passages excuse me, in the Old Testament that emphasize this point. I don't think anyone reading the Old Testament could come to a different conclusion. Um, the Old Testament saints saw children, the bearing of children and the bringing of children into this world as a blessing. All right. Now the big question a lot of us has, have is, did something change when Jesus came? Was there a shift when Jesus came? Did all of a sudden children become less important, not as important? Or are they no longer a blessing? Are they now a curse? Excuse me, I have a very scratchy throat, so you have to forgive, forgive the cough drop and some other things there. Um, well, my answer is, where in the New Testament does anything shift? Where in the New Testament is anything undone that the Old Testament saints say? Where in the New Testament are all of a sudden children considered a curse? Where are they all of a sudden considered not wanted? Now the quiver isn't supposed to be full. Now children are no longer a blessing. In fact, every place we see children in the New Testament, they are considered a blessing. Now let's just look at a couple of those. We've looked at several of Matthew. Matthew 18. It's interesting, every time Jesus came across children, every time he came across them, he considered them a blessing. Okay? He never pushed them away. He never got rid of them. He never wanted to see them gone. He never said these are a burden and a weight to the building of the kingdom. These are really going to slow you guys down. These are really going to be a problem. No, that was the disciples' perspective. The disciples were like, hey, <laughs> these children are kind of, go on, kiddos, go play, in the, go play in the weeds or something. You know, We're done with you guys. All right, no, Jesus said, bring them to me. Bring, let the little children come to me. Okay, and Jesus says that. And Matthew 18 is a great example. Assuredly, I say to you, a little child comes. He puts a little child in their midst. He says, surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. He goes on to talk more about that. The point here is Jesus uses the child as an example of something that is good, something that is desirable, something that is wanted, okay? Matthew 21. Jesus comes into the temple, and the children are singing, and they're praising God, praising Jesus, and they're saying, Hosanna, verse 15, Matthew 21, verse 15, Hosanna to the son of David, and the chief priest and the scribes became indignant. They became upset. They were mad that these children were praising Jesus. And Jesus says, do you hear? And Jesus says, yes, have you never read? And again, he quotes from Psalm 8. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. And notice there's two categories there, babes and nursing infants. Not just, some people like to say, well, you know, Jesus is usually talking about like 10-year-olds. You know, it's usually what he's talking about. In those situations, it's usually grown kids. Well, no, it's not. The word here is brephos, and the word means nursing infant. Okay. In other words, nursing infants can praise Jesus. That's his point. Okay. And that's what that's the point of Psalm 8. And that's why you want children because nursing infants can praise Jesus. All right. And you can go into other passages. Luke and Mark have similar passages there as well. My point is, every time Jesus came across children, he welcomed them. He welcomed them. And I don't know that we could do any better than that. Welcoming children into our midst whether they're our own or somebody else's. Okay, let's look at a couple other passages. Um, remember that, that the New Testament was written over a span of probably about 30 years. Okay, so it's a lot shorter time span than the Old Testament. But the, in the New Testament, you have several passages that talk about children. And again, always the children are, are presented in a positive light. Even Acts 2, which is a controversial passage, I know. But Acts 2 says that the gospel, verse 39, however you interpret it, in Acts 2, verse 39, Peter says, The gospel, the promise of the gospel is to you and to your children and to all who are far off and as many as will call 
as many as the Lord our God will call. Okay, so again, the gospel promises to our children. Okay, they're not outside of the covenant. Acts, I'm sorry, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Write this down and we'll find it. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. Again, there's a, there's a lot of controversy around this. I just want to make you a point about how children are viewed generally. Okay, I'm not going to go into all the details of the passage. All right, just how children are viewed generally. Here again, for the um, start up in verse... Uh, 13, and a woman who has a husband who does not believe if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the, but, sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but now they are holy. Right? Now, we can debate what does holy mean, but the point Paul is making is obviously a positive one. Even the children of a pagan spouse and a Christian spouse, in other words, when one spouse is pagan, even those children are holy. They are good. They are blessed. Okay, we can talk about what all that means, but obviously that is a positive thing. Even Ephesians 6, 4. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, which talks about children and fathers. Let's look at this real quick. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Notice Paul is addressing children in worship. These, these books were read out loud. When Paul wrote a letter, he would send it off, and they would read it out loud to the church. And so the, it was read out loud, and so when he's reading, the, whoever the pastor would say, okay, now, now Paul's going to talk to you children. Children. So Paul considers children a part of the body. Obey your parents in the Lord. Okay? In other words, children in the congregation had the ability to obey their parents. And then he goes back to the Old Testament, and he quotes from the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Okay, again, there it's positive here. Children are included, they're expected to obey. They're a part of God's plan. And then just a couple of others. Um, we could do more, but just a couple of others. First Timothy, I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter 3. <coughs> Paul is exhorting Timothy to be careful about false teachers. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing them, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood. And that word there again is brephos, which means since you were a nursing infant, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy's grandmother and his mother taught him the word, and the church was blessed through that teaching, through his learning and then also Paul throughout 1 Timothy and into Titus always encourages young wives to bear children. The older women are supposed to teach the younger women to bear children, to love their children. Younger widows are supposed to marry and bear children. Okay. So there's never in the New Testament any place where you get this impression that all of a sudden the Old Testament teaching on children has been flip-flopped. That now children are no longer a blessing. That they're now a curse. There's something to be avoided. There's something to be set aside. That somehow the be fruitful and multiply mandate has been pushed away now, now that we're in the new covenant. You never get that impression, okay? And that shouldn't surprise us, but sometimes people argue that way. Okay, so the perspective of both the Old Testament, starting in Genesis, you can go through Abraham's life, you can go into uh, the Psalms, and even there's some verses in Malachi, into the New Testament with the teaching of Jesus and the actions of Jesus, into Acts, into uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus, and all of those areas, Ephesians, the biblical mandate is always the same. Children are a blessing. Children are a blessing. Never, children of covenant Christians, that's what I mean, Christians, are a blessing. Never in the Bible do you get the impression that children are to be avoided, that they're to be put aside, that they're to be shoved aside, that there's something more important than raising children, more valuable than raising children. All right? Children are a blessing. That is the unanimous picture in the scriptures okay is that children are a blessing okay let me say a couple other things about this why are children a blessing all right let me give you a couple of just, just i'm going to say one reason why they're a blessing here there's lots of reasons why obviously psalm 8 mentions one they praise the lord they praise the lord one of the reasons our nursing infants are delighted is because somehow some way they are lifting their voices and praise to god and you may say now pastor peter that doesn't make any sense to me at all she can't even talk she can't say anything. How is she blessing the Lord? Well, that's what Psalm 8 says. And guess what? I take Psalm 8 over your word. 
All right, Psalm 8 is true. So somehow these children bless the Lord. And that's a very important part of worship, isn't it? That we understand that our children, and they're everywhere. All sorts of little children here and there and everywhere. Little ones over here, soon to be. Children everywhere, okay? Sometimes we're like, children, shh, shh, shh. Be quiet, children. This is important, you know? Well, there's a place for children to be quiet, but children are to be engaged. Jesus wants their worship from the time they're like that big, you know? Jesus wants their worship. He accepts it. Isn't that what Matthew 21 teaches us? He accepts their worship. He delights in it. Those breathoses, those little nursing infants, give praise to God, okay? So that's one of the blessings. It's a shame that we as parents often ask our, you know, look down on our children's worship of the Lord because it's immature in some ways. Jesus did not do that. Jesus loved the worship of the children, okay? So that's one way. They worship the living God. That's what children were made to do, and that's what they do when we bring them into worship. By the way, one of the best ways you can do this is by helping them at home in family worship. Uh, that's just one of the be best ways, fathers, you can help your children learn how to worship. The second, thing, the second way children are blessing is that the primary way we advance God's kingdom. Okay, so let's talk about this for a minute. How do we build God's kingdom? We build God's kingdom by making disciples. Okay, a disciple is a learner. A disciple is a teacher, is someone who is taught. Okay, Jesus, when he gave the Great Commission at the end of Matthew, says, go and make disciples. This is our job. Okay? There is no better way to make disciples than by having children. There's no better way. You are with those kids from the time they are negative nine months, okay, all the way till the time they're 18, sometimes longer than that. And you get to see them almost every single day. You get to pray with them. You get to pray for them. You get to walk them through their sins. You get to discipline them. You get to teach them God's word. You get to model God's word. You get to model repentance when you don't model God's word. Okay? You get to do all of these things in front of your children. You never get to do that with anybody else. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship you have with somebody. It doesn't matter how close you are with a friend or a family member. It doesn't matter. You never get to make disciples like you do with your children. Okay? And for years, the church understood this. For years, the church understood that the primary way the kingdom was advanced was through disciplining and training up godly children. Okay, and that's fallen by the wayside, and we'll talk about why that's the case in a minute. So I would say the two, there's lots of reasons children are blessing. We could go on and on, but two of the main reasons are is that they're the way, best way we advance the kingdom, the primary way we advance the kingdom, and then also because they worship God. They lift praise up to the living God. Okay? Let me add one other thing here. Children are not an automatic blessing, okay? Children are not an automatic. You might be saying, well, I have them. Isn't that enough? No, that's not enough. Children are not an automatic blessing. Nothing in this life is an automatic blessing. Okay? Nothing in this life is an automatic blessing. It must be taken in faith and followed by obedience. That's what the blessing is, okay? So let's talk about the Lord's Supper here for a minute. The Lord's Supper sits here, and to those who come in faith... It is a blessing. Okay? To those who receive in faith, it is a blessing. But to those who don't receive in faith, it is not a blessing. It is a curse. And it is the same as true of children. Okay? Children are a blessing in this sense. But if you do not receive them in faith and with obedience to the commandments of God, it's not an automatic blessing. And we see that with some of the Old Testament saints. In particular, I think of uh, Samuel with his sons and Eli with his sons at the beginning of the book of Samuel. Their sons were disobedient. And they never crossed them. They did not train them in the right way. Unlike Abraham, remember God said, I chose Abraham because he's going to command his household how to obey me. Uh, Genesis chapter 18. Excuse me. So just having children is not automatic blessing. Okay? You must have them in faith, raise them in faith, which means you raise them in obedience to the commandments of Jesus Christ. Okay? And that is true of every blessing in this life that God gives. Okay? God's word. One of the best blessings that we have, the only way it does us any good is if we approach it with faith and a heart ready to obey. Otherwise, it's empty. Okay? And that's true of children as well. Okay? I grew up in Mississippi. Probably true in a lot of places, but I grew up in Mississippi and there were a lot of people who had a lot of children. Okay? Now, the reasons they had children were not because they were trying to obey the commandments of Jesus Christ. The reason they had children was because they needed more food stamps and more welfare checks. Okay? There are people who approach children that way. They're a tool to be used. And we don't want to be like that. I'm not saying you would do it that way. But children are to be approached with faith. And we'll talk about that because we need it. Okay, moving along. So how do we get here? So we see the scriptures 
are essentially unanimous from Genesis all the way through the scriptures. Children are a blessing. We're supposed to have them. We're supposed to bear them. We're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Our quivers are supposed to be full. They lift up praise to God, even as nursing infants. Jesus brought them in. He loved them. He delighted to have children around him. Why did we get to a place where children are rejected? Why in the worship services are children often cut out and sent somewhere else as if they're not good enough? or they're not smart enough, or they're not wise enough to worship with us. How do we get to a place like that, okay? And I want to give you a couple of reasons here of how we got there. First and most obvious, and this is, is the failure of the scriptures to be clearly and plainly taught, okay? Somewhere along the way, and we could do a historical study and go back, somewhere in the 1700s, 1800s, the scriptures began to be undermined as an authority in the life of Christians. Okay? There's a lot of, of, of historical reasons for that. Rationalism, romanticism, other things like that begin to undermine the authority of the scriptures. Okay? And so when we reached the 2000s, we reached, I'm sorry, the 1900s, the 20th century, we saw that the scriptures were no longer the benchmark. They were no longer what we went to when we wanted answers. Okay? The scriptures began to be something that we could play with, we could toy with, we could cut pieces out and leave it aside if we didn't like it. Okay? And it started here. It started, well, really, you could say it started in the seminaries. It started in the seminaries, and then it came down to the pulpits, and then it came down to the people. So what was being taught in the seminaries in the 1800s, in the 1900s, the pastors were preaching it, and by the late 1900s, the people were believing it. Okay? And that's kind of the process that it went through. And so by the time you got past 1960 and into the late 1900s, all of a sudden the scripture didn't matter anymore. If I didn't like it, I could just cut it out or I could find a way to reinterpret the Bible. And pastors themselves were the worst culprits and carry the bulk of the blame for this particular mindset. Okay? So the first was a failure of the scriptures to be taught clearly and plainly. Secondly, was a failure of men to lead in the home and the church. Men failed to exalt motherhood. They failed to exalt the raising of children. They failed to praise their pregnant wives and see them as beautiful in their pregnancies. And because of that, the church came to despise pregnancy, came to despise children, came to despise that. Right? So it begins in the pulpit with the pastors, it goes down to the men in the church and in the home. Okay. And that's really a big part of what happened. Third thing, and this is the last of the, there's three theological and then two practical. So the theological is the men failed to pre, or the, fail, the scriptures failed to be taught, the men failed to lead. And then third was a worldview shift. And I, don't, I was trying to find a better way to say this, but really it's a worldview shift. And it had a lot to do with eschatology, okay? Let me, let me take a few minutes and explain this. Eschatology has to do with the end of the world, okay? Now, if you believe the world is going to end tomorrow or any minute, guess what doesn't fit into your picture? Children. Children don't fit in that worldview. Children are a waste of time. What should you be doing? You should be saving souls. I mean, the world's going to end any minute, right? Jesus come back any minute. We need to save souls, okay? Now, when the Reformation and the Puritans up through the 1700s and even into the 1800s, the way the Christian life worked was very ordinary. You, got, you were raised by Christian parents. You got a job. You got married. You had children. You raised those children in the Lord. You went to worship every week. You did your job. You died. Okay, that's kind of how it worked. Okay, and then guess what? Your kids did the same thing. They got married. They had kids. They had a job. The wife raised the children. The father did his vocation. He showed up at worship every Sunday. And then guess what? He died too. Okay, and that's kind of how it worked down the line. Boom, boom, boom. One, the 1800s, something shifted. Something shifted. It had to do with revivalism. had to do with this radical Christianity where now that wasn't good enough anymore. There had to be something radical. You had to do something amazing. You had to have some dramatic conversion experience. And then after, had, after you had that conversion experience, you had to go to the mission field. Or you had to be a pastor. Okay? You couldn't just be a wife and mother anymore. No. That was too ordinary. Now you had to be a missionary and go someplace. And all these stories of great Christians who did great and mighty things all over the globe were put up as the norm. Okay? And so the whole worldview shifted. And you can still feel this especially in the South, I don't know about up here so much, but in the South, you can still feel this. The revival preachers come through three or four 
days, you know, for a whole week, and they preach revival, and everybody's supposed to do something amazing. Everyone's supposed to do something dramatic. Everyone's supposed to have a great, magnificent life. No one's supposed to get married, have kids, do your job, and show up at worship every week. That is way too boring when you do something exciting. Okay? And that worldview shift was very dramatic. That worldview shift completely changed the way we approach children. So no longer, children don't fit into a radical worldview. If you're supposed to be doing something amazing, children don't fit into that. Children are supposed to be are part of a normal, everyday Christian life. Okay. And I, w I really wish I had more time to talk about this because honestly, I think this is one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with today. If you read in books by Christian authors, often what you find is when they talk about the Christian faith, being a father, being a mother, raising children, doing your job, and going to worship every week is not what they're talking about. And the scriptures, that is mainly what it's talking about. Okay? That is almost always what it's talking about when it's talking about the Christian life. There are very few called to be pastors, very few called to be missionaries, very few called to do anything other than live the normal Christian life. Okay. All right, so you've got the failure of scriptures, failure of men, and then I would say the failure of a worldview, and I put dispensational worldview down here, eschatology, this worldview that says everything's got to be amazing and radical, and children really don't fit into that. Okay, they don't fit into that. And you'll, you read some of the missionary men from the 1800s, they completely failed their families. Okay, you read some of the missionaries from the 1800s, their families were destroyed by their missionary endeavors. Okay? And yeah, they might have saved some souls over in Africa somewhere, but they lost their children, and I don't think the Lord is well pleased with that. I don't think he is. Okay, now there's been two other sort of priority shifts that have taken place. Um, and let me mention these as well. How did we get here? That's what we're talking about. How did we get here? All right, and these aren't new <coughs> But they've become dominant over the last 50 to 70 years. Really, you can go back further than that. Uh, and this has really changed our perspective on children as well. First, uh, money became a priority. Okay? Money became a priority for us as a culture. Now, money has always been a lure. Okay? It's always been there. You go back to the Bible, of course, it was there. Paul warned us against the, the deceitfulness of riches and things like that. Okay, money's always been there, but over the last 60 or 70 years, it's become so important to us as a society. The most important thing you can have is more and more money, okay? And of course, children tend to take money. Any of us who know this understand that children tend to cost, okay? Especially if you do it right and you're raising them right and you're trying to provide for them. And if your wife is not working, but she's at home and she's not bringing in a second income and you're not sending your kids to public school, so you're paying for their education and you're paying for somebody else's education at the same time, if you're doing both of those things, okay, all of a sudden it becomes financially difficult, at least on one level, to raise children. And so the priority of money has made a huge impact on our view of children. If your highest good is your bank account, if your highest good is having a certain type of house, a certain type of car, a certain type of life, then children are not going to fit into it, especially a brood of them are not going to fit into it. Okay. So if, uh, that's a shift. Now, again, it's always been there, but it's dominant today. It's dominant, this idea of, of money. And Dr. Moss and I were talking about some of the charismatic pastors, and that's one of their main sort of uh, games they play. It's just if you honor God and you follow God, then he will give you lots and lots of money. Okay, you will be rich and wealthy. The second thing, and this kind of ties in with it, is the priority of personal pleasure and freedom. Okay, and this might even be the greater, greater than money. And this has come about again through a lot of historical processes that have happened over the last 100, 150 years. But right now, if you were going to ask me what is the most important thing to them, and they would say it is my freedom. I want to be able to do what I want to do. I want to be able to pursue the path I want to pursue. I want to get up, wake up in the morning and be free to do what I want to do. And guess what? Children do not allow you to do that. Okay? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Children do not allow you that freedom. Children are in a lot of ways chains. Now, I say that reluctantly. They're not chains. They're blessings. But there's a sense in which they bind you. Okay? They bind you. There's things you cannot do with children that you could totally do if you were free even if you were married, but didn't have children, okay? But personal pleasure and freedom have become the highest good in American culture. 
And because it's become the highest good, children don't fit. Again, especially more than one or two don't fit that equation. And this is where the church right here has really sunk. The church views personal freedom as a high good as well. The Bible does not. The Bible does not view your personal freedom as the highest good. The Bible views obedience to the commandments of God as the highest good. Faith in Jesus is the highest good. And Paul says you're no longer slaves to unrighteousness, but guess what? You're still slaves. Romans 6, you're slaves to righteousness. Okay? So if the most important thing to you, and honestly, I think this is the most difficult transition that my wife and I had to make when we started having more than just your one or two children. The loss of freedom can be one of the most difficult things. We are raised from birth to be free. You know, free. All right? Ladies and men both are raised to go do what you want to. You can be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. You know, those types of statements. They're just hammered in our heads over and over and over again. Well, that's a flat lie, one. Okay? And two, it's not what the scriptures teach at all. So one of the hardest transitions is to get out of this mindset that my personal pleasure and my freedom is the highest good. And I think if we were to ask one another what's been most difficult about the transition to children, that's been one of them. Okay, let me just give you a couple examples from my life. You know, when Julie and I were dating and we were first married, going to the movies was a regular part of our life. Okay? As for many of you, it was. You know, we would go, you know, half a dozen times a year, maybe more than that. If a movie came up and we wanted to see it, we were free to go see it. Okay? We were free to go see it. We well, you know where this is going. <laughs> we're not free anymore, okay? We're not free unless I want to take out a small loan. Okay, mortgage my house, get a second mortgage on my house and go see a movie, okay? But the children are more important than that. And there obviously are blessings that come with children. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying I'm helping us understand that there's been a shift that's had, that we have to make, okay? So the priority of money and the priority of personal pleasure and freedom are two of the great gods in our age, and those two gods do not allow for children. Why do women abort their babies? Well, because it restricts them in some way. In some way, that child's death will free them up to go do what they want to do. Okay? Why do women have two and no more? Well, because those children, more children, will restrict them. And I honestly think this restriction and this loss of freedom is one of the greatest pulls not to have more children. Okay? We came right down to it. Okay, so we got the failure of men to lead, failure of the scriptures to be taught, failure of dispensational theology. Eschata a certain view of eschatology, priority of money, and the priority of personal pleasure and freedom. All right, I'm running long here. So let me give you a few things we can do here. Okay? And again, keeping with my theme here, there's nothing radical here. This is just basic stuff. Okay, basic stuff. What can we do? First of all, and this yeah, may seem kind of obvious, just believe what God's Word says about children. That's where we've got to start, isn't it? And we've got to start with just believing it. No matter what our heart says, no matter what we feel, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is day in and day out, and it can be, we've got to say, Lord, they're a blessing, and I'm going to see them that way. I'm going to renew my mind in Romans 12. I'm going to renew my mind so that I see children the way God sees children. Okay? And it begins in our hearts and our minds. Just having a lot of them doesn't mean you're doing what God said. Okay? There's a certain heart that God wants us to have. Okay? So first of all, learn, pray, seek that heart that sees children as a blessing. For those of you who don't have children yet, do you see other children as a blessing? Or are they just a nuisance? When you invite somebody over to your house, do you hope they don't bring the children? Okay? And do you hope? Well, if you do, then there's probably something that needs to shift in your heart there. Okay? And again, I'm not saying you have to have the children with you all the time. But you want to have a perspective that welcomes the children like Jesus did. I want the children there. I want them there. Okay, so first, renew your heart. Pray for it. Work towards a mind that sees it the way Jesus saw it in the scriptures. Did. Secondly, have a lot of children. Okay, this might seem obvious. Again, but have many children. I, I don't know why scripture really wouldn't do that. What would prevent us from doing that? A marriage that refuses fruitfulness is a marriage, I think, of rebellion against God. Right? The scriptures teach fruitfulness. Teach that children are a blessing. Okay? So have a lot of them. And some of you who cannot have them, 
pray for those who are. Pray that God would make us fruitful as a church. Third, to first have that mindset. Second, practically have a lot of children. Third, rely on God's grace as you bring them up. Okay? I think one of the most terrifying things for me as a parent is thinking to myself, you know, in a few years, all of these kids are going to be out in the world someplace, you know, doing something out there. I have five sons. They're all going to be sitting at the head of their table with their wives and their children or whatever they're doing, okay? And it could be a terrifying prospect, okay, <laughs> to have to do that. Well, it should be. I think of Paul's phrase in 1 Corinthians. He's talking about preaching, but it applies to this as well. Who is sufficient? Well, none of us are. None of us are sufficient to raise our children. None of us are sufficient to do a good enough job outside of the grace of God. So you need to rely on God's grace as you bring up your children, as you raise them. You need to trust in God's promises as you raise them. You need to bring them before the throne of grace as you raise them. Okay? So you are not sufficient. You are not sufficient to raise those children that God has given to you. But by his grace, he can help you. Okay? And so often the reason we get terrified is because we look away from God's promises and look to our own works. Okay? Look away from God's promises and look to our own works. God has promised that our children are a blessing. He has promised that they lift him up praise. Jesus welcomed them. We need to see them that way and we need to see them as a blessing. So we as a church need to remember these call to be fruitful because there's a lot of times we're about to go in there to potluck. I'm not saying anything bad's going to happen. But children spill things. Children are messy. Children do stuff. And it's very easy in those circumstances to forget that they're a blessing. But we as a church need to remember, not just those of us who have children, but those who don't. Children are a blessing from the Lord. And we should be grateful that we've got, what would you say, Dr. Moss, 30? 30 children or however many there are in here. Bill and I have got 16 between us, you know. And lost. We should be grateful that God has blessed us with so much fruitfulness. And we should pray for more and be glad for it. If we do that, he will honor us and we will be faithful. We will learn to be faithful to him in the midst of that. So let's see children as a blessing. Let's have a lot of them. And let's rely on God's grace as we raise them. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you, first of all, that Jesus came as an infant, that he was not ashamed to be born a child, but that he was born just like all of us out of his mother, and that he was raised by a godly mother, Mary, and a godly father, Joseph, and that he learned to walk in your ways and learn your commandments from his mom and dad. I pray that you would help us here to have the right mindset of all our children. Help us to see them as a blessing. It can be hard, Lord, you know. It can be hard, and yet you see all of your children as a blessing. Help us to see our children as a blessing as well. Give us lots of them. We pray for those who, who cannot have any yet, Lord. We ask that you would bless them with children. We pray for those who are not married, that you would bring wives to them so they can have children. And we pray most of all, Lord, for those of us who have them, that you would help us to raise these children in a way that honors you, depending upon your grace and trusting in your promises. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.